Well, a good Friday morning. Thank you for tuning in to the Gardener's Corner program, a Friday feature here on WKRX 96.7 FM and TV Channel 10 located on Channel 191 on Charter Communications. My name is Rob Hall. Glad to be here with you. I want to let you know that we're brought to you today by Goings Auctions and also T.G. Brooks Company. We'll be telling you about the sponsors uh, through the show today. And uh, actually, Goings Auctioneering has uh, an auction tomorrow in Wake Forest. And then next Saturday, that would be the um, the 19th, they will have a auction in Bailey. But it's goingsauctionsinc.com for more information. But we'll tell you all about that and more. And we'll also have that top 10 gift idea list from T.G. Brooks Company with Bill and Roy Brooks that we look forward to each and every year for the month of December. Without further ado, please make welcome all the way from the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, and he had to get up really early this morning to get here on time. <laughs> if you would, please make welcome Mr. Carl. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Man, this weather is some kind of nice cantaloupe. Good morning, Rob. A good morning to you, my friend. And the weather is beautiful. And by the way, we are live in the studio today. Uh, the last few weeks, uh, either myself or Carl has had something going on, and we hadn't been able to to be live in the studio, but we're back, and uh, we'll be back live next week, and, you know, two weeks from today will be Christmas Day, and we will not have a Gardener's Corner program for Christmas Day, but um, anyway, it's that time of the year to where a lot of people are hopefully getting, if they hadn't already, gotten in the holiday mood. It's always a good time of the year to you know, maybe get out and visit some of your friends, but hopefully you can visit them throughout the year. But mm -hmm. it's also a good time to enjoy some extra special treats, which I enjoy those treats throughout the year, <laughs> any and every time I can get them, you know. So. We all do, yeah. But anyway, we are live in the studio today, 336-599-0266. That's 336 336-599-0266. Is our number for the Gardeners Corner program? I uh, I just found out something that we could lead off with um, uh, in the program today, and uh, uh, we've been getting reports uh, from uh, well, one of our extension entomologists at NCSU about, and I don't know if Rob has ever heard of this uh, insect before, the kissing bug. Carl, it seems someone had made mention of that kissing bug uh, to me within the last couple of weeks, and it may have been in a conversation with you, but um, I, I can't remember any of the particulars about the kissing bug, but, but it's kind of a, a, a pretty bad deal, isn't it? It, it is, uh, and there's a lot of misconceptions about what this insect is. First of all, uh, news reports out of Texas and now in, in North Carolina have been stirring up fears about deadly insects and a lesser known but potentially serious illness, Chagas disease. And most people in the United States have never heard of this malady, yet it, it affects millions of people every year in Central and South America. The vast majority of Chagas disease cases are from rural areas in the New World tropics. Cases in the U.S. are rare, and most have been diagnosed from people who have trav traveled here from outside the country. In fact, there, there are at present only seven verified cases of, net, uh, of uh, uh, ver seven verified cases uh, of Chagas disease in the U U.S. since 1955, and none of these was from North Carolina. To put this in perspective, Malaria, a mosquito-transmitted protozoan disease often thought of as exotic, uh, has been, been recorded, recorded 63 times since 1957. And I'm reading from uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Bertoni, who is an extension entomologist at NC State. I'm, I'm directly quoting him. 
Uh, he says, uh, since I am an entomologist and not a medical pathologist, I will not be writing about the disease itself, including its forms of transmission, symptoms, and treatment. However, there are many great resources that describe the disease, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. But uh, I would, however, like to discuss the biology, identification, methods, risks of bites, and prevent prevention in relation to the bugs themselves. On that note, let's start off with a real kissing bug f found right here in North Carolina. And I don't have a slide of this, but the one that he's showing looks kind of like a box elder bug, but it, it has um, a, uh, a, uh, a narrow nose, and it's actually called the Eastern Bloodsucking Cone Nose. And you, it gets that name because of the, uh, the nose is, is shaped like a cone. And uh, he said they are true bugs in the Hemipta family, uh, most, of which w uh, most of which are referred to as assassin bugs. And we see assassin bugs all the time. They're beneficial insects. They eat other, other insects. Um, most species in the family are predators feeding on other insects and arthropods. However, the subfamily tri Triatominae and the subject of this post has largely abandoned the predatory lifestyle for one of blood feeding. These bugs feed on a wide variety of vertebrate hosts, including reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. In all, there are over 130 species of kissing bugs, the majority being found in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, although most species are tropical, kissing bugs are native to North Carolina and have been for as long as humans have been here. At least two species can be found in the state, uh, but it is not frequently, uh, uh, one is more common than the other. The reasons why they are so rarely found are twofold. First, they are nocturnal. Uh, they're night feeders. They prefer to hide, hide during the day. And they may be seen at, at lights at night after dispersing. But otherwise, it's not often that you'll see them in your daily lives. Second, they are often associated with small mammal nests, especially species of uh, uh, wood rats. The eastern wood rat, for example, can be found in North Carolina where it builds nests out of sticks and other debris. And these nests are a perfect habitat for kissing bugs to hide before feeding on the inhabitants. Other mammal hosts of particular importance are opossums, raccoons, and armadillos. But they will feed on a variety of man mammals, including livestock, pets, and humans. As true bugs, uh, kissing bugs undergo an incomplete metamorphosis. After the egg, there are eight nymphal stages in stars before they become adult. All free li living stages feed on vertebrate blood, although they have been known to take other insects as food. The name kissing bug comes from the fact that when the bugs feed on humans at night, they prefer the face, especially the lips and the eyes. Kissing bugs swell greatly when engorged, usually taking 20 minutes or so to feed. Their bites don't initially hurt so, so as to not to wake their victims, but often become itchy, swollen, and painful. The bites can last for, uh, for weeks, and in some cases, allergic reactions to the saliva can occur. Um, so the, the disease cycle begins when a bug feeds on the infected host, drinking blood containing the parasites. Many mammals that are fed on by kissing bugs can harbor the pathogen that caused the disease, but these animals rarely show symptoms. Uh, let's see here. Let's get to the, a lot of, uh, skip some of this here. Uh, humans are not a preferred host and are not typically exposed to the parasite riddled feces of, uh, of these animals. So thus the species native to most of the United States are, are not considered vectors of the disease to humans. Um, let's see what else he says. I should have, uh, I just got this recently, so I should have been, I should have posted some of these pictures up, but I didn't have time. But I guess the, the best thing to, uh, to say is, uh, let's see here. Uh, how do you control kissing bugs? Um, uh, mainly in, the, uh, ca uh, in North Carolina, prevention is the key, and applying pesticides is not advised, as there are no definitive sites to apply the pesticides. The following are some strategies that can greatly reduce the chances of kissing bugs entering homes, especially in rural areas where there are m more mammal hosts. Reduce the amount of debris and vegetation directly around the home. Wood and leaf piles, stacked rocks, and other habitats that attract rodents can also harbor the bugs. 
repair, repair cracks and gaps in homes, use weather stripping on points of entry like windows and doors, and make sure window screens are intact and holes are repaired. If you suspect kissing bugs are in your home, inspect cracks in tight spaces, spaces especially in bedrooms. Lights will sometime attract them. Min minimizing the amount of lights on at night will help to, uh, in this respect. All those, although these preventive measures will help reduce the chances of coming into contact with kissing bugs, in reality it is very unlikely you would ever come into contact with one of these insects anyway. In fact, I have never seen one myself in the wild, even after 15 years of living in the state. Of course, that is anecdotal, but I think most entomologists in the area would agree they are uncommonly encountered. So in conclusion, yes, these bugs can carry a deadly disease. But here in the U.S., especially North Carolina, you have almost no chance of con contracting the disease from these native bugs. Well, that, that's some, some good news <laughs> for us in Dallas. Yes, Let's hope we never have to deal with the kissing bug, yeah. you know, anywhere close by, you know, North Carolina or our surrounding states. Hopefully they won't have to mm. deal with them either. But uh, Yeah, the, this topic has been circulating by, by you know, the news media, and it get, it's getting people all in a frenzy. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that's what happens. Well, you know, when I first saw the picture that you had, and maybe next week, Mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about the kissing bug a little bit more. Maybe you could have some pictures that right. we share with our viewers. Right. And uh, but it kind of looked to me, except for the different coloring, but it almost favored like a stink bug. It does. It, it's it's more um, it, it's more oblong than a stink bug, and it, and it, and it, and it mostly takes the shape of a box elder bug. And I'll have a picture of a box elder. And compare it to the uh, to the cone nose bug here. And, yeah. and, and speaking of pictures, and you know, one thing that we have not figured out how to do just yet is to transmit pictures through the radio to where you can see them. <laughs> but one thing that we can do uh, for for the folks that watch us on uh, TV channel ten on Charter Communications channel one ninety one, uh, we record the show and then it is uploaded to the website radioroxborough.com so you can go to radioroxborough.com at your leisure and watch past editions of the Gardens Corner program and in many many cases Carl has some excellent photographs to kind of so to speak drive the idea home mm -hmm. of what he's trying to you know convey through words but uh Again, log on to RadioRoxborough.com sometimes at your leisure. Check out some of the um, past editions of the Gardens Corner program. And any of you folks that are listening uh, to the radio, if it has ever crossed your mind what Carl and myself look like, it would be worth your while to log on to RadioRoxborough.com <laughs> to watch a past edition of the show to see what Carl and myself look like. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you will be happy with the way that we look, but once you see us, I promise you, you, you will always remember you us. Won't <laughs> you, you won't forget it. <laughs> and we may actually pop up in a nightmare one night. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we won't, but we can't guarantee anything. As the Three Stooges line goes, how much do you charge to haunt houses? How many rooms? <laughs> but uh with all that being said we, we we do take the show seriously although we do make light of the situation from time to time but uh it's a lot of things that's in nature and in the soil that can kind of cause you problems and carl is here to help put your worries to ease about things that you can do to help control them so pretty much if you've been concerned and worried about this so-called kissing bug, just kind of, you know, it's bigger fish to fry. Don't worry about that That's any right. longer. That's so, right. Uh, we'll get a word on in just a few minutes for Goings Auction Company. Uh, they've got an auction coming up tomorrow in Wake Forest. And next Saturday they have one in Bailey. And uh, if you or someone that enjoys... Uh, heavy equipment, farm equipment, auctions like that, Goings Auctions is just for you. 
But we'll get a word on right now for Goings Auction Company, and we'll come back with more of the Gardner's Corner program here on WKRX. Mr. Greg Goings of Goings Auctioneering, NCAL 390, announces an auction for Saturday, December 12th at 10 a.m., located 2725 Height Lane in Wake Forest. Up for auction, heavy equipment, trucks, trailers, and other equipment of Height Construction Company. This auction, Saturday, December 12th at 10 a.m., the sale site and address, 2725 Height Lane in Wake Forest. Log on to GoingsAuctionsINC.com for photographs and more information. Or call Greg Goings with Goings Auctioneering at 252-578-1623. This auction taking place on Saturday, December 12th at 10 a.m. at 2725 Height Lane in Wake Forest. For more information, call Greg Goings at 252-578-1623. Or log on to goingsauctionsinc.com. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. My name is Rob Hall, Mr. Carl Cantalupe, our resident expert with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Um, Carl, um, you know, with you uh, going out and uh, helping educate people with the lectures and talks that you do from time to time. Mm -hmm. Have you got anything coming up in the near future? Well, I guess one thing we can talk about, our annual specialty crop school will be held the first uh, Friday in March, which I believe is the fourth, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we've got a good, uh, good program coming up this year. We've got two uh, direct marketers that'll, that are going to be talking about their own app. Uh, operations. Uh, 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 Ken Walker down in Garner has uh, uh, a, a produce stand and he also has a very large corn maze. So he'll be talking about that. Another entrepreneur grower is, um, oh boy, if I don't have things written down now. <laughs> <laughs> Senior uh, moment Mil kicking in. Milton Ganyard. Uh, Milton Ganyard used to have a, a farm in uh, just on the outskirts of Durham but he moved the farm to another location now and he's I believe he's outside of Cary now so he's going to talk about his operation as well and then now when you say he moved the farm did he move the actual mm -hmm. farm or the operation the operation I think he <laughs> I think he he re <laughs> either he rented the land beforehand or he he owned the land and he sold it. I can't, I can't remember. But it, the, the, you might know this if you know uh, Durham a little bit. Um, if you're coming in Durham on 98, uh, traveling um, out, uh, traveling east, so you're leaving Durham, and, and I guess technically you're still in the, in the, uh, the town limits, but um, the land was was sold I believe and now uh, there are homes built on that land it's called Ganyard Farms uh -huh. and it's uh, it, it, you know it, so that was his original location mm-hmm mm -hmm. so it, it's kinda sad to see uh, urban sprawl sometimes well uh, you, it happens you yeah know? and I, I've heard reports about how many acres of land a day is lost to you know residents or shopping centers or or things like that and mm -hmm. you know it, it, it particularly in this area you know large farms are becoming few and far between mm -hmm. and we've got a a lot of farmers that tend a lot of acres but what I'm getting at is for it to be you know five or six maybe seven hundred acres you know in, in one farm you know I don't yeah. think as many of those and I'm sure it's getting smaller to where it's you know, a lot of them now, where it maybe used to be a couple hundred acres, maybe it's not even half that now, or not even a quarter of that. But mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. you know, because it, one one thing about uh, you know having you know businesses and people move to the area, you know, it, it it's good for the economy and, and so many sure. landowners, 
have, you know, turned in uh, more or less a farm that was they was making mediocre income and sold building lots and, and, and prospered pretty well. Oh, them, yeah, you know? it's, it's especially close to towns. The, you know, the, the, the land it really puts a high price tag on. But anyway, um, one thing I was thinking about we might uh, want to talk uh, about today is um, – uh, the persimmons, we, we've mentioned persimmons before, but, uh, oh gosh, it's got to be now at least three or four weeks ago, I went out to see uh, uh, an individual to to look at uh, something, diagnose a problem, but he had a persimmon tree, um, the oriental pers persimmon, uh, not, not the American persimmons, which are small, but this is the oriental persimmon, and we'll put a picture of this up here. Uh, the variety is uh, uh, Fuyu, and uh, this is a non-astringent type. And so these were picked actually three or four weeks ago, and they were not fully ripened, but uh, they were just left sitting out on the counter uh, at my house, and uh, it so they soften up, and they also increase in sugar content. And they're very, very easy to grow, and this tree that he had was just loaded full of them. So, and they're very, very tasty. Um, they don't have the, uh, the flesh, the, the creamy flesh like the pawpaw does. So the flesh is firmer. However, if it gets overripe, it can get very, very soft. But um, very, very sweet. And, and to, uh, uh, to uh, set the record straight as, and, uh, as far as the, uh, the adage that you have to let pawpaws be frosted before they become sweet. That is not Paw true. Pawpaws or persimmons? Uh, persimmons. Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> uh, persimmons do not need to be frosted in order to develop a sweet flavor. In fact, if they, if they get frozen, th that just cont contributes to them deteriorating much rapidly. So, so with, um, with persimmons, you can pick them uh, you know, before they, uh, they're fully ripe, kind of like pears do and then just ripen them up indoors, they will, they will soften up and they will increase in sugar content. And it's, a, it's a, another good fruit that uh, people might want to try. And if you're not familiar with the word non-astringent, the best way to become a familiar with that word <laughs> is to get a persimmon that grows in the wild mm. and taste it when it's green and it will literally turn your lips inside out. Yeah, and here's here's actually another oriental variety that is astringent. This uh, Haichia is astringent, whereas the uh, the Fuyu is is not. So it's two different varieties. And uh, if people want to know more information on how to grow, uh, we do have good information at the extension office. Just give us a call at 336-599-1195, uh, and we'd be happy to mail you out the information. Carl, uh, what size was that Fuyu persimmon? Oh, that would be the size of a, I would say, a medium-sized peach. Well, yeah. It's a good size. Good size. Mm -hmm. Now, I have had persimmon pudding before, mm -hmm. and I have, you know, eaten persimmons, you know, just like you would any other type of fruit raw. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone would be interested in planting some of the non-astringent uh, Ori persimmon Oriental trees, types, yeah. Uh, is it a lot of care? Do you, do you have to spray them with fungicides? No, and no. Like and this one individual, he was a backyard gardener, and he really didn't do much of anything to it except just let it grow. And, uh, you know, well-drained soil. Uh, you know, make sure your soil is fertile. Other than that, uh, they're pretty much, uh, you know, self-sufficient. And, you know, a lot of people say that possum enjoys persimmons. That could be. But uh, have you ever had any persimmon pudding? No. No, I haven't. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very good. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's other recipes out there that persimmons could be used for. Some of you older folks that are my age or older probably remember this. There used to be a cartoon show on when I was growing up. It was called Deputy Dog. Uh -huh. And he was a cartoon character. He was, uh, he was a depu deputy in Mississippi. And he talked with uh, the real drawl southern accent. 
and uh, his his nemesis uh, was Musky, the muskrat, and uh, he would always chase Musky out of the persimmon patch. <laughs> <laughs> So it's funny what you remember. It, it really is. Uh, and some things you remember, you, you, you sometimes think about, why in the world did I remember that? But it's just something mm -hmm. things kind of lock themselves into your memory, and it's there. Mm -hmm. We are live in the studio today, 336-599-0266. If you've got a question for Carl, give us a call, and we'll do our best to get you on the air. and and get you an answer. And we, speaking of that, we might have I one. Think we have a caller. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardens Corner program. Uh, um, I heard on Channel Four, it was a program that came on. They went out and gathered all kinds of stuff to cook, showing people how they could survive. And they took persimmon seed and dried them and grind them up for coffee. Well, it seems I've heard someone say something about that, too. Yes, they did. And uh, have, have you ever eaten persimmon before? Yes, I like them after the frost bites them. Uh, Walking my dog, I go by and get me a handful and eat them as I go by. Have you ever tried one that wasn't ripe yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of always a little joke to get on someone. It sure is. But, you know, uh, a lot of people also use the persimmon seed to kind of forecast the winter, the winter, so to speak. And I've been told you can take a persimmon seed and cut it in half, and it'll either have the, the, the design of a fork, a spoon, or a knife. And depending on what's inside of the persimmon seed is a way of kind of predicting what kind of winter we have. And speaking of winter... You know, winter starts December 21st, so okay. that'll be here before you know it, and mm -hmm. who knows, we may get some winter-like weather then. <laughs> hey, Rob, but, another thing I saw on Channel 4, these fishing guys. Uh-huh. This old farmer had a tree leaning over the pond, and the catfish was eating them, and they started fishing with cat with persimmon. <laughs> oh, really? Well, hey, <laughs> anything that works, that works, so... Appreciate that information, okay? Okay, thanks, Rob. Have you, a good day. You too. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Yeah, anything that works, by all means, you know, you mm -hmm. use those things to, to try. But, uh, yes, it, it is uh, quite interesting, you know, while the way that some, some of the fruits kind of people take more of a liking to them than others. And I guess the persimmon would be considered a fruit, Carl? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember what uh, what, family, what family it's in, but just to give just to give the people an idea as to the the uh, uh, how how the size compares. Uh, here's the here's the Oriental type, and here's the American persimmon. So you can see the American persimmons are a little bit smaller, uh, but they are more cold hardy than the Oriental persimmon uh, is. Other than that, uh, you know. I would I would try to grow uh, an Oriental persimmon because they're much larger, and they're quite uh, quite flavorful. So, and Carl, now you said that you all have a publication through the Cooperative Extension Service. Yes. About growing persimmons. Yes, we and, do. And to where you could find the uh, a nursery that has the trees. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Carl, uh, from your observation this year, uh, of course, you know North Carolina. It's never been really huge in in pecan production, but there's a lot of people around that have trees and things. I guess, you know, for us, Georgia is yeah, one of the closest states one. by that, yeah. that produces a large amount of, of, of pecans. But uh, have you heard anybody say whether or not they had a pretty decent pecan harvest around this area. No, I haven't. I I I, I don't know. I, have I, I haven't either. And I know some people that that you know have pecan trees, but um, I'm just not sure how well they turned out. Um, also, uh, we'll touch on the um, aspect of um, eating things. Uh, is it true or false that? poinsettia is poisonous to humans and that's false but that's that, that's been a myth that's been hanging around for a long long time back 
back uh, around 1919, uh, there was a story that circulated around that a serviceman's child died from ingesting poinsettia leaves, and there was never any truth to it. So, but the, the story has just you know uh, had a life of its own, and uh, and we mentioned this before back in the 70s, Ohio State University. Uh, the entomology department did a study and they fed rats massive doses of poinsettia leaves and you know it just uh, it, I, I I can't remember how much it took but you'd have to just a tremendous, tremendous amount so as with all house plants you should be careful in uh, in putting them close to, uh, close to uh, children uh, there are house plants that are deathly toxic, like the Diefenbachia, or uh, otherwise known as the dumb cane plant. It has oxalic acid, the same ingredient that's in rhubarb leaves. So I can never remember. It's either uh, it causes the throat uh, to constrict. I, I think it's constriction, or 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 open up wide. But anyway, yeah, the person you know won't be able to, to breathe. Right. So always keep house plants away from from children, but there's no need to fear uh, from the poinsettia being uh, uh, harmful or poisonous. The plant that is harmful and poisonous is the mistletoe. So, not a good idea to serve mistletoe tea. That's at correct. The holiday gathering. Yeah, just uh, just uh, use it uh, to kiss underneath. Okay. okay. <laughs> don't don't bring in, don't bring in kissing bugs. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but uh, don't ingest the leaves or the seeds or the fruit. The, all parts of the plant of the mistletoe are toxic. Well, that that's what I was going to lead up to. I was going to ask where you're going to be serving mistletoe tea <laughs> at uh, the community holiday gathering, but um, you kind of beat me to the punch, so oh, to speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we need to get a word on for T.G. Brooks Company. And, and, and speaking of uh, maybe holiday gatherings, uh, T.G. Brooks has several things on the top ten gift-giving ideas that would be wonderful for a uh, family gathering. Um, and just to mention, uh, hoop cheese, ribeye steaks, and country hams. But here's Bill and Roy Brooks with the top ten gift ideas available at T.G. Brooks Company in Timberlake. It's time for the T.G. Brooks Company Top 10 Gift Suggestions for Christmas with Bill and Roy Brooks. Let's hear from T.G. Brooks now and our annual Top 10 for 2015 from Bill and Roy Brooks. Number 10 on our list this Christmas is for our ribeye steaks and hoop cheese. Always a great addition and great gifts at Christmas. Number 9 this year, Dave, is gas heaters and burner for cooking those many items. Number 8, we always have them. They're good for everything. Gift certificates. You can get them right here in any denomination you want. Number 7, make mom in the yard look good with some fresh mulch. We also have a new addition this year, a new line of flashlights and magnetic flashlights and slide flashlights by Nebo. Several different styles, all LED, great lights. Number five, always a favorite, snow sleds. We have the plastic ones and the wood ones. Number four this year is always a favorite, cast iron cookware. Great selection, always a hit during the winter. It's very versatile, great gifts. Number three, infrared electric heaters for those cool evenings to knock the chill off. Number two is always one that we always love, case pocket knives. Great selection, and it's always a gift that everybody always looks forward to. And number one is country hams. People are already starting to buy them. It's time of the year for the ham. Hey, there you go. The top ten from T.G. Brooks Company. The top 10 gift suggestions. 411 Helena Mariah Road in Timberlake. Stop on in. Bill and Roy Brooks. And our annual top 10 from T.G. Brooks Company. We're all back on the Gardener's Corner program. My name is Rob Almost Carl Cantalupi of the North Carolina Cooperative mm -hmm. Extension Service is here to ask any questions that you may have. 
Uh, Carl, uh, mm -hmm. here it is. Just well, pretty much say mid December. That's right. Um, anything that people can be doing out in the uh, lawn and landscape at this time? Yeah, uh, I mean, just uh, follow up. Uh, you know, it's been a mild winter so far, so if you still have uh, plants in the garden that need to be harvested, like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, go ahead and, and, and do that. I uh, just planted my, myself some uh, garlic plants uh, the other day. And I, I, uh, I direct seeded some spinach seed in the garden. Spinach only needs about a 40 degree soil temperature. So um, I uh, sowed some spinach seed, uh, let them come up. They'll overwinter. And then, then next spring, I'll be all set uh, for the spinach to mature before it gets too hot. So you can, you can give that a try if you like. Um, other things you can do uh, as the leaves fall down from the trees, um, if you have oak or maple leaves, uh, don't go through the, uh, the time and the expense of raking them up and burning them or getting rid of them. Just, you know, do the lazy man's way like, uh, like I do is I, I just run the mower over, chop them up. Yeah. And uh, just go over them several times until they're finely chopped and then just let them lie on the, on the lawn and they'll, they will decompose over the year and provide good or organic matter to the, to the lawn. No sense in, in wasting a good uh, natural resource. Carl, now you have said that uh, when using leaves in a compost pile to kind of speed up uh, decomposition, to maybe put in a little bit of tin, tin, tin fertilizer. Right, just throw a handful in there on the top. Mm -hmm. Now, if um, maybe people have already put some fertilizer out on their cool season grasses, but they are running the more over the leaves, kind of mulching them up and mm -hmm. kind of let them, you know, get down and, and, and just kind of more or less uh, get into the soil. Uh, would it be a good idea to put in a little bit more fertilizer on the cool season grasses at this time? If you have a lot of leaves, would that help them decompose? It would. Well? Sure, sure. That'll that'll help, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's something that you could do. And um, really and truly... Uh, you know, the best time to fertilize cool season grasses is, is it starts in September. And you don't want to wait until, you know, say maybe March, April, or May to um, fertilize your cool season grasses because when you do, you're kind of, in a sense, opening the door for problems, so to speak. Right, especially with brown patch fungus disease. Uh, that attacks a kind of lush growing uh, plant that is really uh, heavily uh, green, uh, dark green color from excessive nitrogen. The nitrogen is, uh, accumulates in the leaf blade. Very little goes into the roots when fertilizing in the spring. And it's this soft succulent plant that is very, very uh, susceptible to getting brown patch later on. So um, spring fertiliz fertilizing of uh, cool season grasses is not recommended. Do your fertilizing in the fall. Another thing you might want to take a look at in your landscape is your, uh, is your shrubs. These are the plants that you, you invest most of your money in. But yet a lot of people are more concerned sometimes about the survival of the lawn than they are with the uh, the shrubs. When uh -huh. you when you've got crepe myrtle, uh, nandina, um, <clears throat> camellias, these uh, you know uh, require more of an investment, and you really need to uh, pay attention and make sure they go through the winter with ample so soil moisture, uh, because soil uh, I mean water added to the soil. Um, um, is like adding antifreeze into your car's uh, radiator. Uh, the uh, the water is in the soil and it helps uh, al the water along with the soil insulates the roots. And um, on on warm days, you actually will get some root growth, even though the top of the plant doesn't uh, doesn't show any growth. So you want to make sure that you have ample soil moisture in the soil, uh, water down to at least six to eight inches. Do the screwdriver test, that is, stick a long handle screwdriver into the soil until it becomes hard to push. Then pull it up and you can measure how deep that soil is wetted. 
water the soil until it gets down six to eight inches deep and then stop. Then don't water again until the, um, the upper part of the soil uh, gets dry and then water for the same amount of time you did before so that you can penetrate that six to eight inch depth. So. All right, yes, uh, by all means, even though, of course, it's going to be warm, you know, the next few days, but even when it's cooler, you know, plants still need water. So just because, you know, it's cool, don't don't say, well, they don't need any water. It hadn't been warm, but, but they need, you know, water on a year-round basis, so to speak. Right, and, and another misconception that people have, and we've talked about this um uh, well, not misconception. Um, people think that the, the soil actually freezes below 32, and it doesn't. Uh, the soil only freezes at 32 degrees. If we get colder air temperatures, that 32-degree temperature just gets pushed further into the soil. Now, uh, so, so people are surprised to learn that. But the other misconception that people have is just because... Uh, you have a, uh, a soil, um, e even though your land is sloped, that does not necessarily mean you're going to have good drainage. Because if you have a heavy clay soil, water still goes down straight. And so, you know, you're, you're still going to have waterlogged soils if it's heavy clay, even if it's on a slope. So, could be, so water doesn't all move down the slope it still moves downward through the soil so so that's you know some a lot of people believe that you know I, when i asked do you have good drainage oh yeah it's, on, it's on the hillside that <laughs> that doesn't count for much <laughs> and, and, and good good drainage is more of the soil type right and you know the mm -hmm. elevation or the decline or the right hillside or whatever Mm -hmm. Call a quick question before we get a word on before for Goins Auction Company. Um, as far as the Christmas tree goes, what do people need to be doing about that? Well, go ahead and make your selection if you haven't done so uh, yet. Uh, go out, run your hands uh, along the branches, make sure the, uh, the needles stay attached. Uh, bring it home, make a fresh cut at the base of the, uh, uh, the trunk. Uh, then put it in a Christmas stand right away, add warm water um, so that the water can be taken up um, through the vascular system of the tree. Keep an eye on the water level in the stand. Make sure that you don't get an airspace between the, the, uh, the butt of the, of the trunk, the tip of the trunk, and the stand so that the air does not start to move up in the tree in through the vascular system of the tree. If that happens, it becomes very difficult for the the tree to take up more moisture. Uh, no concoctions are needed to the water. Just uh, just plain ordinary warm water is, is fine, but just keep sh make sure that the level is, uh, is fine ev every day. Make sure that the tree is secure in the stand. Um, check your lights, make sure that they're all in working order. When you leave the house, pull the plug. And, um, uh, you know, th by doing this, you can en enjoy your tree for the uh, for the Christmas season. All righty, some, some good information. Uh, Carl, another thing about Christmas trees, and um, we'll maybe make mention of this again next week because um, we will not have a Gardener's Corner program on Friday, Christmas Day. So the following week, we will be on, on New Year's Day, and that will be a pre recorded program because Carl will actually be off from work from that day. But what I'm leading up to, um, after Christmas is over and you are discarding your live Christmas trees, uh, what are some of the things that would be good to use them for, the, the, the discarded Christmas trees? Um, some people will put them, in, if they have a pond, they'll put them in the pond, sink it, and sink them and hold them down with cinder blocks, and they make good uh, fish habitats. Good idea. Hey, we've got a caller. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner Program. Hello, Rob. It's me again. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to tell you something about a Christmas tree. Okay. A man and woman went out and got a Christmas tree, and he put it up, and his wife was standing up on a stool decorating. He went and took a bath, and she started screaming, snake, snake. It was a snake in the tree. Oh. So he hops out, 
slipping in the sliding naked, and his dog slipped up behind him and put his nose on his butt, and he fell and broke his broke his bed. This is a true story. <laughs> oh, Lord, really? <laughs> so I guess he wound up in the hospital. The doctor had this put in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, good gracious. Uh, that That is something else that you need to do when choosing a tree. You need to make sure that it's not infested with insects or right. or other things. But right. uh, that's that, that's some good advice. Appreciate the call. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Yeah, I guess you know one thing can lead to another, so to speak. But mm -hmm. but when choosing your Christmas tree, and I know a lot of people in this area go out into the woods and cut their own trees, and as warm as the temperatures have been. It could be some, you know, snakes crawling around. So just kind of do a good visual inspection. Hey, we need to get a word on for Goings Auctioneering. We'll be back to wrap it up on the Gardener's Corner program. Mr. Greg Goings of Goings Auctioneering, NCAL 390, proudly announces a huge auction sale for Saturday, December 19th at 10 a.m. in Bailey, North Carolina. Up for auction, trucks, guns, knives, toys, and other items. To view photographs, terms, and more information, log on to goingsauctionsinc.com or call Greg Goings at 252-578-1623. It's assets of Lawrence, Bissett, and others. Up for auction Saturday, December 19th at 10 a.m. The sale address 6662 Rhodes Road in Bailey. For more information, log on to goingsauctionsinc.com or call Greg Goings at 252-578-1623. The sale address again, 6662 Rhodes Road in Bailey, North Carolina. Call Greg Goings at 252-578-1623 or log on to goingsauctionsinc.com for more information about this huge auction Saturday, December 19th at 10 a.m. in Bailey, North Carolina. Well, here we are back on the Gardens Corner Program, and this reminder, Goings Auctions is having an auction tomorrow in Wake Forest. Then coming up on the 19th, they will have one in Bailey, Log on to goingsauctionsinc.com for more information. Well, Carl, I think we've got about one minute. Uh, what would you like to talk about the last minute of the program? Uh, let's see. Real quick, like, we, we talked uh, be, uh, during the show, during the break, about the uh, 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 Asian lady beetles. And, and uh, you know, people have uh, sometimes will have infestations of these along with box elder bugs. That's what the Asian lady, be lady beetle looks like. So... If you have them, you know, just sweep them up, vacuum them up. They're they're harmless, but they congregate in buildings now, looking for warm quarters to overwinter. Log on to RadioRoxburg.com to view past programs of the Gardens Corner program. Let's go wrap it up. Special thanks goes out to our sponsors, Goings Auctions Inc. dot com. That's Mr. Greg Goings at Goings Auctioneering, and also we appreciate the support of T.G. Brooks Company. Remember. The top 10 gift ideas available at T.G. Brooks Company. They've been in business since 1936 at Landmark in Timberlake. Head on by and see them. On behalf of the folks here at the radio station, special thanks to you all for listening. A thanks goes out to Mr. Carl Cantalupi for sharing Thank you, his Rob. expertise. And we want to wish you and yours a happy and safe weekend. And we look forward to seeing you next week for another edition of the Gardener's Corner Program.